morning, guys. It's uh, good to see all the men here together. Hope you're doing well uh, this morning. For the past 10 years, I've had the privilege, responsibility as well, to be the Dean of International uh, Schools in Latin America, ministry training throughout Latin America. And as you can imagine, that involves working with churches, it involves working with our schools primarily. Uh, and churches in the United States that want to do mission work and are supporting the schools in different parts of Latin America. That has given me the opportunity to visit several countries in Latin America, and uh, one of those countries is where we have a school in Dominican Republic. So this morning I was asked to talk about the Dominican Republic, to talk about the work going on there, but specifically to talk about a new work, or at least a work that is uh, on the hearts and minds of a church in Arkansas uh, who is looking for a new mission point. So uh, that's what I'll be discussing this morning, and hopefully you'll find it encouraging as, as I have uh, beginning to work with, uh, with this church. Uh, so the Dominican Republic, I wanted to mention a few things about the Dominican in case maybe we're not familiar with uh, this country. Uh, it is... Out in the Caribbean, it is uh, together with the country of Haiti. It actually shares, oops, did I go forward? Sorry. Yeah, it actually shares the island of La Española together with Haiti. So two countries on the same uh, piece of land. Uh, it is the second largest island in the Caribbean, second to Cuba, of course. And it has the distinction of being the first landing spot of Christopher Columbus in the New World. Back in 1492, he first stepped foot on the shores of La Española, the, the island. As you can imagine, that would bring a lot of uh, pride and um, on the part of the Dominicans. You know, this was where Christopher Columbus landed. And so, as a result, there is a lot of firsts in the country, uh, and I'll mention that here in just a moment, but it's, it's really an intriguing place just for the history of it. Uh, its official language is Spanish. Um, about 10 million in the Dominican Republic, 3 million of that number actually live in the capital city area. Uh, it is Santo Domingo is the capital, and so... In that metropolitan area, we're talking about three million people or so, so about a third of the country live in that area, that, just to give you an idea of uh, you know, the size of, of this city. One of the things I found interesting is that it is the most visited destination in the Caribbean, uh, Dominican Republic. It seems like everybody wants to go there, and you know, it has the beaches and all these things, and uh, that are supposed to attract a bunch of visitors, and I guess it works because it is the most visited place in the Caribbean. Uh, this past summer, though, you may have heard in the news, you know, of Americans who were going and just falling dead, and so it was during this time that our trip was scheduled to take place, and so I would get calls from uh, the brethren saying, uh, is it safe to go, or <laughs> are we going to die? I mean, should we reschedule or something, you know? So it was kind of interesting, right? The, the tourism really went down this summer. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things you have to take into consideration, I guess, if it's safe to travel. Um, it is the site of, as I say here, the first cathedral, the first castle, the first monastery, the first fortress, the first university, and so on and so forth because of its age. Uh, think about this. 1992, they were celebrating their 500th anniversary, so that's a long time, right? And that's been a few years back already, so a lot of history in this country. The colonial zone in the capital city is a world heritage site, and what that means is it is a very special place that attracts visitors from around the world just for the history of the place. Uh, so, a lot of people are interested in seeing the Dominican Republic. The capital city of Santo Domingo is a modern city. You do have skyscrapers, you have modern buildings, you have uh, what you would find in a lot of European uh, cities. They even have a metro uh, that's pretty, pretty well traveled throughout the city. 
One of the things I found interesting was this picture here to the left. Um, to the left, yeah. This looks like Washington, the Washington uh, Memorial, doesn't it? Uh, except they have a little lady painted down here on the bottom, uh, which ours doesn't have, right? But it was cool driving down the road and you kind of just see this, what looks like, you know, the, the Washington Monument, and you're going, this is kind of out of place. What's this doing over here? Uh, but to say that is to say that they have a lot of interesting things that you probably wouldn't find uh, in other places as much. This is in the colonial district, so it's a, it's a beautiful area. I mean, this is like picturesque. Walking down, imagine, you know, a nice fall, sunny day, mild temperatures or in the spring. And you're going shopping and, you know, you're in these uh, places where all this, uh, you know, artistic works are being sold and knickknacks you can buy. I mean, that's what this place is like in the colonial uh, district. It's beautiful and laid back and what you would think a Caribbean uh, travel destination would be like. In the evening, you get sites kind of like this, uh, also in the Colonial District. Just really beautiful place in Santo Domingo. Uh, so because this was the landing point for Columbus, you have Columbus all over the place. So this is a house that belonged to his son, Diego, and it is one of the places you just have to go see. It's known as the House of Columbus, right? So you can go and visit and see everything, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful place, really. Let me tell you a little bit about the backstory. The church that wants to do mission work. So they are a congregation known as the Village, the Hot Springs Village Church. So Hot Springs, Arkansas is kind of a, a tourist destination in itself here uh, in, in our country. But about 10 miles to the north is this little enclosed retirement village. And it's the strangest thing, uh, at least to me it was, because when you go to the town, you, you walk in uh, or you drive into a gate. There's a guard. There's a little house, you know, a little guard post. And then you drive in, and probably for the next 14 or 15 miles, it's this village just completely enclosed. It's kind of like a retirement center, but it's huge, right? And uh, anyway, at the church, there is an interesting mix of older folks and younger folks. Am I doing something wrong with this mic? No? Okay. Uh, and so it's a retirement village, but you would be impressed with the number of young people there and, and mixed in with people who have retired from all over the country. They come to this place and uh, that's what the church is like. Uh, it, it, you would think it would just be older retired folks and there is that, but there's a whole bunch of young people there as well. Anyway, this church is interesting because uh, they had a goal. They had built a building several years back, a brand new building. Very nice. And they had a goal to pay it off. And when they would get it paid off, they said, we want to do missions somewhere. Their target date was sometime in 2021. Uh, they came to Sunset last year, 2018, kind of asking for our help and guidance. And we'd like to do mission work somewhere. We've traditionally done mission work in Latin America. Can you kind of help us find a spot? And so uh, Tim Burrow and Doug Reeves and I went to go visit uh, a year ago in 2018 and talked with them, met with their missions committee, and then we did a follow-up visit in April of 2019, and we identified, they identified two places they were interested in, Cuba and Dominican Republic. So they wanted to go see both places. Uh, the Cuba trip didn't pan out. Uh, we were supposed to go this summer, but that didn't work due to travel restrictions and, and things uh, that they couldn't make. But we did make it to the Dominican uh, in, in July uh, this year. One of the things that was interesting is that they called us uh, in April and said, hey, we paid off our building early, and so we're ready to go. We've got money that needs to be spent in missions. We, we kind of need to step up our time frame. 
And I was like, well, let's go then. You know, but I mean, how many churches call you and say, hey, we've paid off our building. We've got this cash we want to put into missions. Can you help us? Yeah, I, th I think we can help you with uh, that need. Oops. The place that we went to is a place known as Duverge. It's in the southern part of the country. Uh, it is close to Haiti. And to be honest with you, I thought I was more in Haiti than in the Dominican Republic uh, when we visited the congregations in the area there. So it kind of gives you an idea. Santo Domingo is over here, um, the capital. And so this was about a four-hour drive uh, coming back down this way. Here's the border with Haiti. Uh, so that was the area that they uh, are interested in. Now, Duverhe is a city of about 20,000. It's not very big. But the thing about it is that it's the central point for that whole area. And so when you pretty much get to Duverhe, you get to that whole region, right? So they're thinking not only of the outreach within the city, but how it can benefit the rest of that area and even into Haiti uh, as well. It is an area that is growing in population, and most of that growth is coming from the Haitian side because a lot of Haitians are moving from Haiti into the Dominican Republic. This is kind of where they land. Uh, so it's becoming a, a mini Haiti within the Dominican Republic. That's kind of the area that we're looking at. There's no church present in that city right now, but there are some congregations in the surrounding areas. And I'll show you some pictures here in just a moment. Most of them are in very poor uh, condition. So this is a crossroad location. It's one of those places where you get uh, a lot of Dominican traffic and you get a lot of Haitian traffic in this one place. So it's a pretty strategic uh, location. We drove by the border and uh, none of us wanting to go into Haiti at the moment just kind of made a U-turn right here. I stuck my head out and, and snapped this picture to show something of the border, but we were that close. Uh, Haiti is just on the other side. This little girl caught my attention. On the way to church, she looks at me and just kind of stares, and I pull my camera out, my phone, and snap a picture, and she stops, and she looks at me, and she puts this kind of frown on her face, and it I thought to myself, she's saying, who said you could take my picture, buddy? You know, but then she just kind of kept looking at me, you know, and then she would walk and then she motioned once like this to like, you want to come to church type of thing. And so I kind of put these captions on here. I'm going to church. Want to come? <laughs> and by the way, who told you you could take my picture? Uh, she followed us throughout the time that we were there. Um, interesting that... <laughs> Here was where they were meeting for church. It's basically a hut. Uh, no roof. Here she is down here at the bottom, wondering if I'm still coming, you know, or if we're coming. This is inside, nothing but dirt. Uh, these are just, you know, huts enclosed somewhat just to have a meeting place. Uh, no roof, so when it rains, you can imagine uh, kind of what happens. Our team is right here. This, uh, this brother here is named Jeff. This is uh, Jerry. He's the uh, deacon in charge of missions. And this is Daniel Neen. Uh, Daniel came here not too long ago and was with us for a while and spoke and here in chapel. Uh, he's the director of our school and so they're kind of looking at him as being the contact for the work that they want to do in uh, Duverge. Uh, Jeff here was a missionary in Bolivia for several years, so uh, he's a member of their congregation. So he's kind of like the contact guy and the one that can kind of help guide them and stuff like that, which is helpful if you have a guy like that. Anyway, we were uh, in worship service here and uh, they asked Daniel to get up and say some words, and he just stood up here and, you know, he broke down crying. He couldn't even speak, mainly for the, the conditions in which they found themselves in. And yet when they sang, man, they sang with such strength, they sang with such fervor, uh, you couldn't tell that they were 
in these uh, needy circumstances uh, physically. There was kids everywhere, uh, all over the place. Uh, inside, they would get together, they'd sing. Uh, they, they were always curious as to, you know, who we were and uh, what we were doing and, you know, why we were there. And so they'd kind of follow us and kind of be looking at us like, you know, we're not too sure about you guys. You look kind of questionable. Uh, but they were cute the whole time. This brother here, this was an interesting, uh, this was uh, around Duverhead. There's a few miles away from the city. This is a brother, I, I forget his name, but his house from this left picture is to the right. What, what he decided to do was, knowing the state of a lot of the churches, having these hut locations to worship, he decided to build a building on right next to his house. And he said, I've already told my kids and I've already put it in my will that this is not for the family. This is for the church. And, and so he's building this all by himself. He, he gets enough money. He buys cement blocks and he's wanting to build something that is going to last for a while. And so on this picture on the right, we're down at the lower level. We've walked down here and he's telling us about how, you know, all of this has come about. He says, I just wanted to do something for the Lord and for the church. And I want something that's going to be here after I'm gone. He says, I just get money and I buy a few blocks and we do the work and like that. And I, we asked him, how long have you been working at this? He says, oh, we've done this in three months. And I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty good progress in three months. In contrast to this congregation that meets under the tree, this is where the church meets. And when it rains, the tree helps to shield us somewhat, but not completely. So you go from a hut to under a tree to a building made out of concrete blocks. I mean, you kind of see the gamut of things. We visited another church and it was the same thing, just a, just a hut. The difference is they actually had a roof. Well, somewhat of a roof, uh, but you know, dirt floors, and they're just as happy as anything, though. The joy that they have, um, the singing, uh, the fellowship, it's, it's humbling. It, it really is humbling to see them. Of course, the kids, more kids, they were all around us. They wanted to hold our hands, you know, after a while. They'd want to kind of take us around, and so I'd start snapping pictures, you know, and and when they figured out what was going on, they all kind of gathered together and like, take our picture. You know, we want to be in the picture. And so there they, there they are. Uh, this is another congregation a few miles further down the road. And it's a little more typical for that area. Uh, these boards are made from the palm trees around or they come from those palm trees, and then they just kind of fashion them together and put together a building as best they can. This is what it looks like on the inside. Uh, those things are really hot. You know, they keep in all the heat. There's not a lot of ventilation and stuff. Uh, but once again, as with other cases, we find them to be very encouraging. Uh, visiting with them, you can't, you can't tell that, you know, they're affected by the poor conditions in which they find themselves, physically speaking. The ones that were taking us around, the brethren that were taking us around, uh, said, well, we got to go up the mountain now. This was an hour and a half trek driving up this mountain. Uh, I thought, man, if we find a church up here, it's going to be uh, amazing. And, of course, we did, but uh, we just this road seemed to like go forever, and I thought... Uh, it's just God and this mountain and us, you know, there's nothing else. This was the building of the congregation we made it to, to visit. Uh, again, you know, just a very poor uh, condition. This is the inside. <laughs> when we got there, there was a few sisters that had gotten there early, you know, it's always the ladies. Uh, and when they saw us, we walked in and... They looked at us, and we looked at them, and they were like, come in. <laughs> it's okay. We don't bite type of thing. And so we walked in, and then uh, we're talking with them, and 
The rest of the brethren showed up, more children. Uh, this was about halfway. And as time went, we just, you know, more and more people came type of thing. The, the place got packed. But they had a more uh, solid building. They actually had metal on the top of their roof. They had thoughts of uh, wanting to build another building. And everywhere we went, they told us the same thing. We need help. Uh, we're grateful to God that we have what we have, but we need we need help. Um, after we spent two days there looking and visiting at the, looking at the place where they wanted to do the work and visiting the churches, we headed back to Santo Domingo. And uh, most of the highway was like this. It, it was kind of interesting that the trees just kind of formed this arch. And so it's, it's an eternal tunnel of trees that you're driving through. It's kind of, kind of interesting. For those of us here in Texas, you don't find this, right? Uh, <laughs> maybe in other places, but uh, not, not here. Uh, we stopped at Iguana Park on the way. There's a rest area that you can stop and visit the iguanas. These things are huge. Uh, and when you show up and you're walking around, they just kind of come up to you like, are you going to feed us? Or I, At least that's what I thought, you know, are you going to give us something to eat? I, I thought maybe they wanted to eat us because some of them were huge. Uh, so, yeah, a whole bunch. I thought that was kind of interesting. We made it back to the capital city of Santo Domingo. We spent Sunday with the church there. And so look at the difference. Uh, very modern, uh, very well-built, uh, beautiful congregation as far as the building goes and the people as well. This is a church about 300, uh, more or less. And so we spent Sunday morning worshiping uh, with them there. Afterwards, we went to go eat lunch together. We drove down another one of these picturesque streets, and I just called this Umbrella Avenue because they just had this. And this is about halfway through, you know. Uh, we turned, and we were going down this street, and these, all these umbrellas were just hanging, you know, over the street. And uh, it, it was beautiful. So, they, I mean, you, you, never, you never know when you're going to find something like this uh, there. Well, they told us, before you go home, we've got to do the ice cream. Uh, so if you go to Dominican Republic, do the ice cream, because it's like one of the great things. And so they took us, uh, this is my first attempt at a selfie. Uh, so I barely got myself in here. Here's Daniel. There's Jeff. This is uh, Daniel's family. This is his daughter and his wife, Evelyn, his son, Isaac, and brother Jerry. Uh, he was happy. He doesn't look happy in this picture, but <laughs> he kind of had that get me out of here face. I, I think we're, he was just ready to go back home. Uh, but anyway, so that was our visit. That was our trip. We got to see a lot of good things. But more than anything, we, we got uh, Brother Jerry here motivated about doing mission work even more in uh, the Dominican Republic. So all of that is in process. Please pray for the work. In the Dominican, they're looking to begin something uh, at the beginning of this coming year as far as beginning a work in, in Duberhe. So that's pretty much it. Beautiful place. Thanks. <laughs>